go. Thanks so much to everybody who participated in last week's discussion, either in the classroom or online. So uh, I went through and made some comments where appropriate. Um, and I just handed out a similar paper as I did last week. So if you're in class on a Tuesday, you can always participate in the discussion in class. And then you would not have to actually do it uh, online. Uh, if you miss Tuesday, of course, you can uh, uh, do the, do the uh, discussion as long as you get it done by Sunday. Um, we are good. So here we are today. I don't see anybody in chat. That's not a good sign. But maybe they'll say hi now that I said hi. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of uh, 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 a little bit for Isaiah's uh, benefit because he's just joining us for the first time today, but we did already talk about the streaming aspect of things and that uh, all the lectures are also archived online. So if you want to know where to find them, you go to the home page of our class. If you are using a laptop to see Canvas, are you good with Canvas? If you're, yeah, okay, awesome. So you just click on there and it'll lead you to the place where the streaming happens. Actually, we should look at it just once more because it's a little bit uh, of an interface is a little bit, uh, well, the good thing is that our live stream when you're streaming it is right up here, introduction to electronic media in progress. Click on that and you'll find the stream. So that's nice, at least uh, if it's in a page of kind of undifferentiated tons of stuff, at least it's on top. And then if you missed it, you can always go to uh, the YouTube archive and uh, it, just down here, you'll see the classes listed. And uh, so it looks like we got the last couple of classes up there. Um, so that's how you find that. That's under streaming information, which you can get to off the links on the front page. OK, so that lets you either attend class in person or show up just for a few select dates. So just a reminder on that. We're going to have a quiz on February 21st. We will prepare in advance for that. Uh, and in fact, every Thursday we do Kahoots, where, which is like a little game we play with like a question and answer thing. And those are actually questions that show up on the quizzes and the exams. So you have to be here on February 21st, March 14th for the midterm. On April 25th, we're having an industry news uh, presentation, which is real short, simple presentations about the latest things happening in the broadcast field. So you got to be there to do your short little presentation and then for the final. And those are, so those are the days you absolutely have to be here. Otherwise, you can be here if you like. And it's totally appreciated because the more people are discussing with us in class, the more interesting it is. Or you can you know, stream stuff if you want. All right. Um, I've been using these first few discussions to get us prepared for an eventual assignment, uh, which is coming up in February, towards the end of February. So uh, we have a couple of research papers for this class. And the first one is due on February 28th. So again, just want to show you guys that you're already working on this by doing the discussions, OK? There are four uh, topics that you can choose from. And last week's discussion was helping us generate ideas about this topic. Radio remains relatively popular and competitive despite competition from other media. Discuss the factors that have allowed radio to survive in a telecommunications landscape. So we had ourselves discussing that in class and online. And uh, if uh, by February 28th you decide that this is the uh, topic that you want to work on, feel free to you know, dip back into your discussion for what you said, for what other people said. All those ideas are uh, common community property. Let's put it that way. The class owns them now. Uh, but of course, since you had your ideas, you're probably most invested in them. But, you know, draw on that for that essay topic. So that one is going to be four to six pages in length. And we will, of course, be talking about that, you know, the format requirements, stuff like that before, uh, before it's all due. But this week, uh, we are 
orienting our discussion around this topic, discuss the impact that the network system had in developing a national culture for areas or advertising, entertainment, political broadcasting. So uh, is the door open, Rick? Yeah, come on in. And uh, you may discuss either the early days of radio or early television. Okay, so today uh, in the latter part of the class, we might kick off a little discussion about this one. And uh, as you can see from the paper I handed out, the discussion topic pretty much, you know, kind of sets this up and gets us talking and thinking about it. Okay, so hopefully this will give you lots of ammunition when it comes time to write that essay. And, uh, um, oh, also I've arranged for a visit to the library. So I sent an email about that on February 28th. We're uh, going to meet up in the library. I'll be announcing this like crazy in advance. Uh, so, so the librarians there will uh, lead us through one of their seminars about how to research stuff. So it's like, what are good search topics? How do you use the library website to find pertinent information? How, what, what websites should you trust and others that you should ignore as you're looking for information for your research essay? So I'll be, uh, I'll be advertising that. As, as we get closer to that date too, but um, that could be real helpful. All right, so uh, you know, our Canvas site is all organized in weeks, and this is this week, January 29th and the 31st, and we always have a little bit of an overview here. Uh, just to focus in, to give you a better idea of what I think is the most important stuff in the chapter, because the chapters are gigantic, it's one of those textbooks um, and um, Isaiah I can uh, tell you about how to get a hold of the textbook after class or something. So this helps us kind of narrow down the information. So on Tuesday we're going to talk about inventors especially uh, and my argument here is that although in, in history we tend to celebrate the individual, if you look at the development of technology it's always a kind of a collaborative effort, a cumulative collaborative effort. Someone moves the ball one place and somebody else picks it up, moves it again, and sometimes they're actually fighting each other in this development as we'll see. So we're looking at early inventors who put the pieces of radio as we know it together, entrepreneurs, so we're looking at uh, how radio figured out what it could actually do as a medium and how best to organize itself so that you know, uh, uh, they enjoy economies of scale, that you could concentrate production in a few places and then distribute all over the country. And that would allow you to pay a lot of money to the few artists who are at that central point of, uh, of creation and you know, reuse it in many, many uh, different markets and stuff. So, this is kind of the embodiment in an industry sense of the, the mass media uh, uh, model that we talked about in the first week, which is from a center point, you know, the same information goes out to many, many people, right? So we'll talk about that today, and then we'll get into our discussion about networking and a natural, national culture. Then on Thursday, we'll try to follow radio's, you know, kind of second life in the 1950s, where it really gets knocked off its perch by television, finds a way of reinventing itself and uh, 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 looking at FM satellite and some of those newer services that are out there. So uh, in a sense, we already cracked this topic open in our discussion last week. This week, it's really to, uh, we'll, we'll learn more about the factual history from the textbook. And that's the textbook, although it is, so full of information it's almost you know hard to digest the good thing about it is it, it has a lot of facts that are verified uh, and uh, uh, you know um, although every fact in the book I don't expect you to remember all of it it's there that you can draw on it for your research essays or for the particular things you're interested in okay so that's what we'll be doing this week so that's what we want to focus on and like I said Tuesday we will have a cahoot to Get those, um, get those questions before us. That's another good indication of uh, what I think is important in the sea of information that's in the textbook. Secret life of radio. Our friends at the BBC, very geeky friends, 
uh, <laughs> did this amazing documentary way back. Uh, it's, a, it's a series of stuff. This is about radio history. Dubstep. Still relevant. There's something rather magical about radio waves. They're actually a sort of invisible energy. This aerial can actually pick up enough of this energy to power this primitive receiver I made. It has no battery. It relies entirely on harnessing the energy of the radio waves in the air. It's not very loud, so um, I have to put it straight on the microphone so you can hear it. I managed to pick up Radio Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem on it one night. Although there's something quite wonderful about this little thing, radio sets have been around for so long now that uh, they've become rather ordinary, unglamorous contraptions. And even the electronics inside now look rather familiar. In this program, I'm going to look at how these mysterious radio waves were discovered and how radio receivers managed to pick them up. Creating radio waves is actually very simple. Any electric spark emits them. Each of these sparks is sending out radio waves. You hear them on the radio as interference. That's why lightning makes radios crackle, and even the tiny spark inside a light switch is enough to produce a little pop. But without a radio set, though, it's not easy to detect these waves, and most scientists didn't believe they existed till just over 100 years ago. What finally convinced them was an experiment performed by the physicist Heinrich Hertz in 1887. It was first demonstrated in Britain by a scientist called Oliver Lodge here in the Royal Institution. Hertz used very big sparks created by a, a machine like this called an induction coil. You turn it on, Bill. This was connected to these metal plates with another spark gap in the middle, and uh, this acted as a sort of aerial. This was Hertz's receiver. It's simply a loop of copper wire. Well, the big spark uh, creates radio waves with enough energy to make a tiny spark jump across the gap between these balls in the receiver when they're held very close together. So. Um, Hold these in position. OK, Bill. If you look carefully, you can just see the spark jumping across the gap. These sparks are so tiny that Hertz had to let his eyes get accustomed to the dark for 15 minutes and then watch the sparks through a magnifying glass. His apparatus only had a range of a few metres, and he had no interest in finding any practical uses for it. The first person to use radio waves for signalling was Giuliano Marconi. Marconi had been a difficult child. His mother was a Jameson from the Irish whisky distillers who'd run away to Italy to be an opera singer and married an Italian landowner. She quickly got bored on his estate. What's going on here? I think we'll go for a little jaunt. The infant Marconi spent much of his childhood being dragged round Europe by his mother. Where are we going, Mama? <laughs> Barcelona, or perhaps Boulogne. Um. He showed little interest at school and constantly irritated his father with ridiculous scientific experiments. Uh, 
You're my blade, though. I smash you out of face. Shortly after failing to get into university, he happened to read an article about Hertz's work. Oh! He immediately started obsessively experimenting and had soon managed to transmit the signals over a mile. Still aged only 20, he arrived in England to try and sell his ideas. Marconi had found that fixing one side of the spark gap to a long vertical wire made a much better aerial than Hertz's. This was further improved by connecting the other side of the spark gap to Earth. Apart from that, the transmitter was basically the same as Hertz's. Any electrical spark will do. Here it's being provided by the ignition circuit of Rex's pickup truck. This primitive transmitter has a surprisingly long range. Marconi also used a much more sensitive receiver, called Coherer. This was based on a design by Oliver Lodge. This is my homemade version. It's just a tube of nickel filings. I made it by filing down a coin. You fix one end to the uh, aerial, another kite, uh, and the other end to the earth. And what happens is that when it detects the radio waves, its electrical resistance falls dramatically, so it acts as a sort of switch and turns on a circuit. The theory behind it's very complicated and wasn't worked out for till many years later, but it's quite simple to make it work. The only slightly complicated thing is that you have to have something to shake it to restore its high resistance at the end of each signal. So now if I signal to Rex, This is Marconi's original equipment that he brought to England with him. This is his transmitter with an induction coil like Hertz's and these balls that concentrated the energy of the spark. One end would have been connected to the aerial. This is his receiver. The aerial went on here. This is his coherer inside the glass tube. The filings are actually in the gap in the middle. And this is the device to tap it. Marconi would have been sending a, a combination of long pulses and short pulses, uh, sending messages in Morse code. Well, this original apparatus only had a range of about three miles, but Marconi gradually increased the sensitivity of his coherers and the size of his transmitters till he was sending messages hundreds of miles. The larger transmitters had much larger spark gaps, which got very noisy, so he had to take to putting them in enclosed boxes. Marconi's early systems had a big disadvantage. They couldn't be tuned. You can hear the signal from our spark transmitter all across the short, medium and long wave bands. The reason is that sparks create chaotic waves of all sorts of different wavelengths. What was needed was a more precise transmitter than a spark. This was the solution, the tuned circuit. It suddenly all starts to look like a proper radio, but the basic parts are still quite simple. There's a coil of wire here called an inductor and a series of overlapping metal plates here called a capacitor. The electricity whizzes backwards and forwards from one to the other, oscillating thousands of times a second. The valve acts as a sort of pump, keeping the whole thing going. You can see a picture of the radio waves this tuned circuit's transmitting on this oscilloscope that I've hooked up to a short aerial. If I hold it near the tuned circuit and switch on, you can see how regular the oscillations or waves that uh, it's transmitting are. Now if I compare this uh, with the spark machine, you can see just how chaotic its radio waves are. Once the tuned transmitter had been perfected, spark transmitters were quickly banned for polluting the airwaves. With the problem of interference solved, radio seemed so miraculous that it could be capable of almost anything.
Early radios did still have one limitation. They couldn't transmit speech, only the simple pulses of Morse code. Morse code still used for messages on the shortwave band. All right, OK, that's enough geekistry. <coughs> Come on in, have a seat. And always be, be sure you can, you, can, no, you can go sit down. Very respectful. Thank you. OK, so uh, you know, part of our beat in this class is involving the technology, part is the sociology, the history, and all of it. So what I like about this uh, film clip that we saw here is you know, it really gives you a sense of the, the primitive aspect of early radio, right? I mean, it's being recreated now with like filings of coins and you know, little uh, batteries and stuff. It's very, very uh, 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 you know, simple technology ultimately. As, uh, of course, it wasn't simple at all at the time to figure out how it works. And, to develop it, so, uh, but but it gives you a sense of early on, you know, that this was really a, a an experimenter's medium, that uh, uh, you know, inspired folks to an enormous amount of work to, to develop it into what we know of as radio today. You know, Marconi's credited as the you know quote unquote inventor of radio, and then there's. Um, of course, a, a subtler story to tell just about the many people who, who uh, contributed to radio. You know, because basically where Marconi brought it was Morse code transmissions. And his you know, immediate market was government who wanted a way of you know, uh, putting ship to shore communication together. So that, because yeah, one of the, you had the telegraph on land, which of course was where Morse code was developed, and what was useful about it was you could have you know, instantaneous transmissions of messages and stuff. They didn't have anything for the maritime trade, you know, for for boats and stuff, which was real important for safety and also for you know being able to communicate. Okay, I'm this boat. I'm coming in. I'm bringing this stuff. So that seemed to be immediately like the the best application of this was to put a transmitter on a boat so you could be you know told like where where they're at and what they're bringing to shore and stuff. So uh, at at the beginnings of radio, uh, with all of this, you know, they don't have voice and they don't really have a conception of mass media. It's it's going to be uh, a a point to point communication. It's going to be a way that a boat can tell an agent on land what's in it. Uh, so it's point to point. Um, <clears throat> and so this is how Marconi tries to sell it with, as they showed, you know, the big innovation being able to tune a circuit allows many different transmissions to happen in the same geographical area. That was another limitation of Marconi's early work was that uh, you know, his sparks would cross every frequency in the area. So just one person doing a transmission would basically fill up. If you had two people, you couldn't tell one person's pulses from another. Communication wouldn't work. So tuning uh, was, a, you know, was a, big, a big deal. Um, and these folks are not mentioned yet, but here was the, the next step after the tune circuit, which already was big enough for Marconi to bring to New York. And he, he sailed his boat, the Electra, which was this huge yacht that he had equipped with radio stuff. He sailed it up and down the Hudson like with, as a huge PR stunt. You know, We've got this great new thing, radio, and Marconi, myself, I've invented it and stuff. So he was really the, the, you know, the, the entrepreneur, the guy who put himself forward as the inventor. And in some ways, that's why we remember him better as the inventor of radio. There's an interesting reading that we won't dip into, but it's on Canvas, which talks about Tesla, who had similar ideas and also was you know, thinking about how can we use you know, the, ability, the, the electromagnetic spectrum, the radio, you know, the, the, the spectrum that surrounds us. How can we use that to carry energy? You know, so he also thought of radio, but we don't think of him as the father of radio. Marconi supposedly is. Fessenden um, solved the problem of how to uh, uh, put 
voice signals on there. So prior to him, it's, it's just uh, Morse code. Fessenden figures out how to modulate that signal. You saw the AM signal, right? Uh, the tune signal led to these very regular uh, uh, radio waves, right? Well, uh, Fessenden realized that if you vary that same frequency, but you vary the amplitude of those waves, the difference between this and this, for instance, could be decoded as the difference between, you know, one voltage is another, one, the loudness of a voice or something like that. And so this is called amplitude modulation, AM, which for that time and for a long time, a couple of decades, was, you know, what radio was. So AM standing for amplitude modulation. There is a signal, you know, right now, like let's say, 900 kilohertz, you know, it would be an AM signal. And what happens is we modulate the amplitude of the wave and thereby we can inject kind of vocal voice content, music. So he, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it's on New Year's Eve in the early 1900s, shocks everybody, all these amateurs who'd been listening to radio Morse code, because he gets on there and he reads, I think reads from the Bible, he plays his violin or something like that. I and mean, it's in your textbook exactly the stunt that he pulls. But uh, it's like, whoa, man, someone's talking to me over this, you know. And at that time, it's, it's you know, just, it's possible to pick it up as an amateur with just, you know, a little crystal, right? And an earplug like they showed you. But the other thing that really helped us along this way was an inventor named Lee DeForest who took... Uh, you saw what they called a valve. Anyone got an electric guitar amp or something with a tube in it? Yeah, okay, Chris. So, and then yeah, other folks, anybody got any tube Fenris? I'm not surprised, Fenris, knowing your, your interest in old, old school tech. So before we had transistors, we had these big tubes which did the same thing. <laughs> and and uh, uh, DeForest realized that you could, by modifying the tube a little bit, uh, you could turn it into an audio amplifier for radio. <coughs> that meant that the signal could be sent much further, and when it was picked up, it could be regenerated and amplified in your, in your home system to give you a nice loud signal. So DeForest created what's called the Audion Tube. That's DeForest's thing. All right. So let's just see if... Uh, you know, again, my argument is that uh, this technical development of the radio system was, can I make this get out? Yeah. The technical development of the radio system was uh, a cumulative effort. And so we've already seen, you know, Marconi thinks, yeah, we could use this to communicate, but he only got to Morse code, you know, and then Fessenden realizes, okay, if we do it this way, we can actually get voice and music up there, but it was still kind of weak. And then DeForest perfects the audion, which makes the signal that much louder. And then it's, you know, far more, you're, you're, you got a radio system where you can transmit voice or music or whatever, but audio signals hundreds of miles on a tuned circuit so that people could be on different frequencies and picked up. So it's, now it's starting to look like radio, thanks to all of those different uh, um, contributions. Well, if you're interested in this early stuff, there's a Ken Burns documentary called Empire of the Air, uh, which is centered around the patent conflict between DeForest and another early inventor of radio, uh, Edwin Armstrong. And he's the last person that uh, is, is on my short list of radio inventors because Edwin Armstrong actually eventually single-handedly invented FM radio. Uh, so, you know, we've had the AM system up till now. Armstrong uh, found a different way of, create, of, you know, putting the signal into the radio waves and uh, um, invented FM radio. So I'm just thinking... I'm thinking I don't have time to dip into either of these, so sorry about that. But you could, you could look these folks up if you want. This one looks promising, how Lee DeForest, a con artist, created radio. Um, they called him a con artist because DeForest wasn't really a very accomplished engineer. He was like an inventor, but he didn't exactly know 
ex why the stuff that he invented worked, but he was very, very hardworking guy and found, you know, oh, somebody has invented this thing. Let me see if I can tweak it and get it to do something else. So he had a, a kind of mentality where he didn't understand exactly fundamentally why everything worked, but he would get stuff and play with it and tinker with it and he'd get it to do something useful. And literally this guy had a couple hundred patents back in the early 1900s based on that, including the Audion tube, which was like a regular old vacuum tube, which everyone knew about, but he tweaked it a little bit and it turned out to be really useful in radio. So he had a kind of genius about just tinkering, not really understanding, but getting stuff to work, you know, as if he was a garage guy. Armstrong, on the other hand, was like an engineering genius and uh, taught at Columbia University eventually after he became famous. But his big um, uh, invention, he had a couple, <laughs> one before FM radio anyway. Uh, he came up with a regenerative circuit, which would basically take the radio signal, feed it back on itself multiple times, and make it extremely powerful. He did that when he was in the Army in the First World War got recognized for that, and when he got out, went into business and invented some other stuff which was central to radio, and he had all the engineering chops, okay? Uh, so uh, he eventually uh, looked at one of DeForest's later inventions and said, man, you're ripping me off. The, you know, the, 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 I, I have a patent on this. And DeForest, well, his stuff was always slightly different, and so they got into a patent war that lasted uh, a decade or so uh, while they were fighting with each other. So each of them contributed to radio as we know it now, especially Armstrong. Uh, but apparently DeForest really didn't know what he was doing. So when it went to court finally, uh, and you know they were trying to figure out, well, who really has a claim to this? DeForest got up and sort of didn't really understand why his thing worked, you know versus Armstrong was able to explain in exact detail all the principles behind what he'd done. And so they kind of felt that Armstrong was more credible at that point. Uh, but uh, DeForest was involved in many, many kind of patent wars like that. And, uh, Armstrong eventually uh, became very bitter about, although he was recognized and became rich and he became a millionaire, he was, he was uh, pretty bitter about being recognized pulse codes are also for used. the genius you know of, of what he did um, so let's zoom ahead here to uh, I'm, I'm sorry if you find it a little bit silly the animations that they do and stuff but uh, I don't know I, they're historically accurate anyway um, so this uh, we're moving through the documentary here from the BBC which again is very geeky interesting in that way to uh, to the invention of FM radio. So, I mean, we can backtrack because a whole industry was created on AM radio, right? But if we just want to stick, finish up our story about <coughs> the innovation of radio, um, we have to get to FM. So as you can see, AM had some uh, drawbacks. Number one was it was very susceptible to interference. They showed you there that just turning on a light next to the receiver would create electromagnetic sparks that would, you could hear it. Uh, in a thunderstorm, your AM radio would be like, <laughs> your signal would get ruined because all of that electrical energy would get into the amplitude signal and <laughs> like blast it out at some points, create terrible noise. Um, so radio inventors, particularly Armstrong, was interested in, well, how could we improve this and make it so that you know it's not susceptible to interference and stuff like that. And in fact, they also found a system which had much better sound quality. So I think this is about where I should start showing you this. Sorry, friend, you old style portables have to go. But look at our new RCA Victor portable radio. Came through without a chip. RCA Victor's non-breakable impact case means no chipping, no cracking, no breaking. And hear that tone. It's RCA Victor's great golden throat sound. 
see the world's only portables with the non-breakable impact case as low as $27.95 at your RCA Victor dealer. The biggest change in broadcast radio since the war has been the introduction of FM. The great advantage is that it's much less susceptible to interference. The spark which drowns out AM radio is hardly audible on FM. Why should you use the phrase guerrilla warfare? FM stands for frequency modulation. The principle behind it is really quite simple. Instead of the sound altering the amplitude of the radio waves, as in AM, it alters their frequency. FM radio was yet another invention of Howard Armstrong. He started work in the early 30s with a missionary zeal to produce true hi-fi radio. After encouraging tests with RCA, the company suddenly pulled out. Sarnoff! Well, why have you cancelled my project? Ah, get off my back. Hi-fi radio is nothing. the thing the TV future. Yeah. When FM radio was becoming established, Armstrong and RCA started a lengthy battle over the patents. You have stolen radio. my ideas. He's you did lying. not. He's uh, I was the now. inventor. No, certainly not. How, how this had a disastrous that? effect on his health and on his marriage. Oh, I've had such a terrible day. By the way, I'm leaving. This is the last straw. I can't take any more. Uh, That was the abbreviated animated history of Edward, Edward Howard Armstrong. Uh, so uh, I guess that wasn't the most effective clip to show based on this guy, genius inventor. Uh, but he did, uh, based on his early work in AM radio, which made him a millionaire and also got him a permanent position at Columbia University, and he went into business with early NBC network, which was run by a fellow named David Sarnoff. And this worked out great for both of them. Uh, Sarnoff uh, had been uh, a uh, kind of a young, hustling guy from the streets of New York, really coming up from nothing, who went to work uh, around 17 or 18 with Marconi because he recognized a real possibility there. Uh, and Marconi, uh, set up a company called RCA after the First World War um, because uh, Marconi as an Italian wasn't allowed to control such a big chunk of U.S. broadcasting. And uh, uh, Sarnoff did very well within that company and uh, eventually, you know, you can see RCA became a, a, a radio manufacturer and to create content, uh, they created a company called NBC a network, and Sarnoff took over that and ran NBC for 50 years about. So uh, it's a real rags to riches and kind of insane character type story. Uh, Armstrong, brilliant inventor as he was, came up with FM in the early 30s. It was a superior technology. It wasn't susceptible to interference. It was uh, better quality sound in every way. It was better, and it was Armstrong's entire achievement. He didn't owe other people patents or anything like that. He stood to be incredibly wealthy based on that. But Sarnoff saw an industry problem, which was that everybody in the 1920s had bought an AM radio. In your textbook, there's, I think, a graphic, anyway, that shows just this explosion of people buying radios, AM radios, in the 1920s. So you had just asked oh, people to pay like a month of their salary for you know, a, a, an AM radio on the basis that, yeah, this is great. It'll get you free entertainment from here on in. All the big stars are on radio. It's super great. And then would you come back 10 years later and say, OK, throw that one away and get an FM radio? Probably not, especially since they already had television on the horizon. By the late 1930s, television was just a couple of years away in terms of research and development. They're not going to tell everybody, throw away your AM radio, buy an FM radio, because they want people to keep their AM radio and go to TV. So Sarnoff, who at that time you know, was incredibly powerful, uh, basically tried to tie Armstrong up. You know, Armstrong comes in thinking, well, you're my partner. We did great in AM radio. 
I've got this amazing new thing. And Sarnoff says, well, you know, I don't know if he said it directly, but it's like, no, we're not going to push this. In fact, we're going to challenge you in court, tied it up for decades. And this is where Armstrong became really bitter about, you know, in his view, he had created the very best technology, but the industry was not going to roll it out because of their, uh, you know, priorities and such. So it's true that eventually he became, you know, despondent, all of this, he poured tons of his money and he's one individual fighting RCA NBC. You know, it's like, wow. So he poured a lot of his fortune into the court battle and uh, put a lot of stress on his marriage. It did break up, and eventually he jumped out of the window of his, you know, Park Avenue penthouse uh, and, you know, fell, fell to his death. And this is a guy who used to climb, like, 100-foot-high antennas on top of buildings just for, you know, for fun and stuff. So it's kind of... It's kind of a sad, sad end to somebody uh, just whose whole life was you know, dedicated to putting together radio. Pretty much tries to tell the story of the inventors of, of radio. So there were uh, a bunch of them, you know, from Marconi to Fessenden to DeForest and Armstrong. Those are the, the big contributors that we, um, that we recognize. So in terms of public acceptance and the growth of an industry, there's a slightly different story to tell. Some, some characters, especially uh, Sarnoff, David Sarnoff is you know, central to, to both, basically. Um, there's uh, a couple of watershed moments, pardon the pun, but uh, the sinking of the Titanic brought a lot of attention to radio at the time uh, because they were able to radio for help, uh, and their distress signal was picked up on the east coast of the United States by a bunch of people. Uh, and in fact, a boat that did manage to get to the Titanic, a little too late to save a lot of people, but they did manage to save some people, had also picked up the distress signal. So because the tragedy was so huge and so well publicized, it did focus a lot of attention on radio as a kind of a point-to-point uh, -point safety medium. And Sarnoff, you know, ever the mythologizer in his later life said that he had been one of those radio operators who had picked up uh, the, uh, the distress signal from the Titanic. Uh, don't know if that's true or not. <coughs> However, he did, uh, um, you know, he did profit on from this, you know, notion of radio in in the 1910s they're thinking of radio as point-to-point -point communication uh, and uh, this this is a real interesting part of it too because from our vantage point we're so used to what radio is now it's hard to kind of imagine and this is what I, I I'd like our discussion today to be a little bit about as well is trying to imagine what it would be like uh, you know, just the way you guys sort of have lived through the adoption of the, of the smartphone. Uh, back in those days, living through the, the, the emergence of radio is, is even more of a massive change because literally it's like you've got sound coming out at you from the air, you know. No, <laughs> it's like, wow, isn't that incredible? Um, but they didn't really understand how they could profit from it or use it. And uh, so, as we mentioned, Sarnoff was an important person at this point. And another of the things that he claims credit for, but of course a lot of people were thinking through this idea, was the idea that you could use radio to send music to people, uh, rather than just point to point, the equivalent of sending a telegraph message you could put music out over it and people could uh, you know, get it uh, uh, and, and use it for entertainment at home. So he wrote at some point and published in a magazine uh, what he called the Radio Music Box Memo, which was basically dreaming up what could we do with radio. I predict that one day radio will be like a music box in everybody's home, bringing them entertainment and music which at the time was an interesting and different idea. Maybe not his alone. Yeah, we could use this to bring entertainment. Um, and so that's a very famous memo. You can Google it and find it in a couple of seconds. 
He also, if you look in the New York Times, you know, they have everything from the 1870s up till the present. You can find lots of other thought pieces from Sarnoff, which, uh, uh, including one uh, which was, well, how shall we pay for this? What if we have three gigantic radio transmissions that will cover the entire United States? You can look this one up too. Uh, and so he's basically, although he doesn't have the notion of a network yet, he's basically saying, what if we just had three mega transmitters that would put out music and entertainment and news for everybody across the US? Wouldn't that be amazing? And you know, 20, 20 years later, there's three major networks doing something similar. You know? So he was in his way, uh, you know, uh, a guy who pulled together the ideas of, of the time and, and really saw where radio could become what it is that we're thinking of. You know. Technically, World War I interrupted some of this uh, development. And uh, uh, however, it did train a lot of operators. And for instance, Armstrong made big advances when he was in the Army about making radio transmissions more powerful and stuff. Uh, so in a business sense, you know, after uh, the First World War, which was really very useful because prior to the First World War, you know, these inventors were all fighting with one another. When the war happened, the government took over all the patents and just said, make the best radio system you can, guys, because we need this in the national interest. And so a lot, of, a lot of things that had been, you know, slowed down by the patent wars just advanced pretty quickly. So by the 1920s, they had a, you know, a functioning radio system that uh, could be tuned and travel hundreds of miles on a good day. And, uh, uh, you know, people, hackers, individuals, they started experimenting with uh, making programming, starting up stations, if you want. And uh, um, uh, uh, Westinghouse starts selling a radio set so that people can uh, uh, get, these, get these signals. Uh, the government, that was the point of this slide back here, uh, they started off with the Radio Act of 1912, where they said, well, you know, if people are, everyone is just like, it's a free for all, we'll never be able to profit from the airwaves and this great new technology. So they started licensing different frequencies where people could play around, but also frequencies reserved for, you know, public use and for commercial use. And then later on, they had the beginnings of, well, they had the Federal Radio Commission, which becomes the FCC, uh, the Federal Communications Commission, which regulates all of broadcasting. So they did that because they saw there was a potential for an industry, but government needed to control it, you know, so that there could be, uh, uh, for instance, so you could uh, start up a radio station and know that somebody wouldn't open up down the street on the same frequency and drown you out, basically. Right now, you couldn't have a business if that was allowed, right? So that's why they, they started that up. So uh, yeah, uh, enough of uh, this uh, lecture, which as you can tell, you know, history is bottomless. You can go on forever and ever. So um, just thinking about this um, discussion that you could either do online or participate in now in class. And, and so um, the discussion is basically, th this is, you know, some of, some of our research work is kind of really about, you know, industry competition and facts about what happens. But this one's more about imagining, like, what goes on. So um, the, the, uh, the topic asks you, you know, imagine that you live back in the 1920s when radio didn't exist or not as we know it now. The only mass media you knew was your local newspaper, right? That's where you got all your news and stuff from. There were magazines for, you know, entertainment maybe, and movies for going out to the movies and stuff. Uh, within a couple of years, radio came in, starting bringing live information about events happening all over the United States. So how would this change your awareness of national news, politics, advertising? So there's a little clip here that we could look at. Uh, it's from a fiction film, but it just, and it's a little bit later. But it kind of shows at least one angle on it. 
Good morning, everybody. Disaster. This is radio station KOAT Albuquerque. Bob Bumper speaking and bringing you another on-the-spot report of the Leo Minosa rescue operation. Since the operation began three days ago, the drill has cut its way 57 feet closer to Leo. You have just heard the voice of Sam Smollett, the man who was in charge of the drilling job. This man, together with Sheriff Kretzer and a crew of volunteer rescue workers, is tirelessly fighting this battle against stubborn rock and fleeting time with a human life at stake. If anyone can lick this, this curse of the mountain of the seven vultures, they can. Ladies and gentlemen, something phenomenal is going on here, right in front of this 400-year-old cliff dwelling. A new community is springing up, a veritable town of tents and trucks and trailers. Standing here, I can pick out license plates from California, Arizona, Texas, and Oklahoma, and more cars pouring in all the time, and more volunteer workers from all over the state. Top flight newspaper men from the biggest papers in the country are here. The most outstanding of these newspaper people is, of course, Chuck Tatum, the courageous reporter who first made contact with Leo last Saturday. Later on in this broadcast, we will try to get Mr. Tatum to this microphone. In the meantime, I'm sure you'll want to hear from some of the folks who have gathered here to hope and pray for Leo's rescue. This gentleman right here, what is your name, sir? Federber, <clears throat> Al Federber. What business are you in, Mr. Federber? In the insurance game in Gallup. Uh, feel right at home, Mr. Federber. Speak right into the microphone, please. <clears throat> uh, we're from Gallup. Uh, this is Mrs. Federber and the boys. It's a very wonderful thing to see a man and his family come all the way from Gallup to join us here during these anxious days. Well, I didn't exactly what you call join. I heard you talking to some other people on the radio last night. We were over there in our trailer having supper, and they said they were the first ones here. I hate to call anybody a liar, but that just plain isn't so. My wife will bear me out. Uh, Nellie, who were the first people here? Tell them. Why, we were. I wouldn't lie about a thing like that. Well, I'm sure you wouldn't, Mrs. Federber. And now, Mr. Federber, what is your reaction to this wonderful job being done here? Well, I think it's wonderful. I run up against accidents all the time. I know what I'm talking about. I'm in the insurance game myself. You never can tell when an accident's going to happen. I sure hope Leo had the good sense to provide for an emergency like this. Now, you take my outfit, the Pacific All Risk. We have a little policy that covers... Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. <laughs> I'm sorry we have to interrupt these on-the-spot interviews, but I see it's almost time for Mr. Tatum to make his first visit of the day to Leo. Okay, so... Give, I mean, this is a fiction film and such, but it's, it's dramatizing certain things which were happening at that time in terms of a national awareness. So how do you think radio affected like that kind of situation that we're seeing there? What, what did it allow to happen that probably hadn't existed before? Kira? It allowed everyone to come together. Coming together based on what? Based on? Uh, to help out something, like to work together. Right. Cry for help. Sure. So, so radio provides a kind of uh, a new communication tissue between everybody, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, it's uh, in an event like that, you know, in terms of news, many more people would hear about it in much faster because radio has that instantaneous transmission. You know, I think prior to that, you could have read about it in a newspaper but it may not have moved quite so fast. In this case, you can see we got synchronous communication happening, right? He's actually there talking into the microphone and people are hearing it locally and you can imagine, you know, people from all over the country are picking it up and are coming in to help out, you know. So, so how does that uh, affect, do you think, people's conception of themselves as American, if I can zoom out that much. Christopher was, and then uh, Julian? Yeah, Yeah, just right now, it definitely increased their sense of community, I guess. Um, certainly locally there, they feel more of like community, uh, especially with like local radio programming, but it definitely brings uh, people from across the country together, um, especially with like human interest stories like that. Right. Anyone can relate to that. Yeah, and those were really big, you know, events in, in right. broadcasting in those days, those types of things. Yeah, absolutely. Julian? Even if you didn't have, like, access to a radio, you might hear it somewhere. Mm -hmm. For people that couldn't read it, like, right. you know, the newspaper is the way that most people get the news. Actually being able to hear something means that people that aren't, uh, that aren't literate can yeah. actually be involved. In it. That's, that's a great point, absolutely. Yeah, radio removes the barriers to, you know, national or community participation that might come up from, you know, illiteracy. Yeah, absolutely. Or, uh, so, so that's a real good point, too. 
Do you think uh, it reinforces um, a sense that we're all in this together in a way? You know, I think, yeah, Julian, more? I mean, so like, say there's a radio in like a cafe or something then people will start to talk about it as people hear about it. So it's like, you might just be sitting there drinking coffee and you might start up a conversation with the waiter over it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so it's like something as basic as that means that people are talking about it even if they're removed from the situation. Yeah, yeah, got it. How about the immediacy that something like that broadcast can bring, you know? Eventually, like, if they, if they lower the microphone down into the pit where this poor person is trapped or something, how do you think that affects an audience? What difference would it make, for instance, to, to read about somebody, like a quote from them, versus to hear them talk? Yeah, Kira? Um, it makes it more real. It makes it more personal because you're hearing someone's voice like that. You, you can like empathize with them now because you, you'd be like, oh, I, that could be me one day. Like, what if that was me yeah. like, talking from the well or whatever? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And other people? Other, anyone want to add to Kira, her idea? One second, I'll get to you in a sec, Julian. I'm just trying to see if anyone else wants to talk. Yeah. It adds emotion. Uh huh. So, um, you, like she said, like you kind of sympathize with the people or the person who's going through it, and you might be able to relate. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, the 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 idea I th that, that I'm kind of driving at, which it could be, you know, more or less shared by people in the country at the time, but. Is that you know there there is there's a collectivity a community a, a we that is not just because we live in the same place or all pay taxes it's a kind of an emotional or a pseudo emotional bond in events like this at any rate where you know we can hear the voices of other people we can like you say we can relate so the national you know the American identity is. You know, maybe when you go to war and people feel really patriotic or something like that, you would have had sort of those feelings of collective belonging or something. But now you've got a radio system which can, you know, uh, engineer that around these kinds of emotional events or responses or stuff like that. So I think it brings a kind of an emotional aspect to a national culture and a feeling of belonging. And it also kind of, it makes it material, you know, before it might just be an idea in your head. Yeah, we're all Americans and, you know, it's great we had, you know, we founded our country based on X, Y, and Z. But now you're going to have this kind of emotional input coming to you like on a daily basis, basically, you know. And, and whereas, you know, you might have just been only concerned about what was going on in your community and things, you know, in Washington were far away. Now you've got a, pr a president like FDR, and this is in your textbook as well, uh, who comes at you talking one-on-one, -on -one basically, into, into your living room in a way that you've probably never heard before, you know? Uh, gosh, everyone is, I swear. <laughs> Fireside chat. So this is the first of President Roosevelt's fireside chats from 1933. So the country is in crisis uh, because of a, you know, a banking meltdown. And uh, Roosevelt uses radio in 1933. So this is when things have, you know, we've been through the 1920s boom. People are used to hearing the radio. Kira, what did you want to say? Sorry? This is a podcast? This is, uh, in 1933, a radio broadcast from the president. And he did a series of them called the Fireside <coughs> Chats. So there's a whole bunch of them here in this playlist. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah. So it's there, uh, well, it, it is in a way, I mean, it reminds me of President Obama doing YouTube addresses or President Trump tweeting, you know, yeah. in a sense that it's very direct. So listen to what it Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking 
but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation as... Okay, so he doesn't exactly sound like he's whispering in your ear before bedtime, right? <laughs> but he's a lot less formal than people of the day would have been like, I know it would have been like you'd hear the president like doing a speech from some, you know, back of a train if you were lucky enough to see him like tour through your town or otherwise you'd probably just read what he had to say. But here he's he's saying I'm going to explain what we've been doing for you in so in you know basic terms so that it's not like bankers you don't need to be a banker to understand it. And uh, you know what he had to explain of course was that. Um, uh, there, there had been a panic and people were withdrawing all their money from the banks and you know if you go and do that the bank doesn't have enough money to give out right it's all kind of like <laughs> it's all this this grand scheme of credit and stuff like that so the the government closed all the banks to stop everyone from taking their money out and of course they were uh, incensed about that but the danger was that if everyone went in you know one bank after another was falling it's like I can't give you your money. I don't have any more, so we have to close the bank. So, you know, literally the, the U.S. Uh, you know, banking system was falling apart. So they shut them all, and that's what he had to basically explain. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I come to this because, you know, this is a good example of things changing in terms of politics, right? Where the president no longer does a big public speech or has to talk to you through the newspapers or something. The president talks to you directly like a normal person in your living room, right? And so, I mean, you could think now or later for your essay about how that has continued, you know, even to our present day. You know, Trump and the White House are saying, ah, the media is lying to you, fake news, don't trust any of it. You know, all the professional reporters are, you know, dismissed as, you know, conspirators or something. He wants you to listen to the tweets, you know, or the, the direct communication from the, from the president. So what's your response to that? Do you think this kind of direct communication is, is productive, healthy? Is it a good development? Yeah, Rick? Well, it puts everyone on the same page in real time. Like, I'm guessing back in the day, like, you had your local newspapers, and that's where you get your news from. And it would take time to travel yeah. to the end, like, you know, the person at the other end. So there might be some national news. But right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it puts everyone, in politics, it puts everyone on the same page. Instead of him traveling and, like you said, on the back of trains, mm -hmm. he could just do a broadcast. Yeah. Everyone gets the same information at the same time. They could go offline and go offline. <laughs> they could go like like turn off the radio and go talk, you know, with their locals about you know what they just heard. And I like that. that. This is really cool. That there's a couple of people being talking about what happens after the broadcast as well, and that's really that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. So so yeah, it, you know, and it it, it puts before us uh, you know a single person like the president makes them very very important versus maybe your local congressperson or your local government might have been more present to you, more important to you prior to broadcasting. It really concentrates the kind of symbolic power in the hands of some individuals, like the, whoever can get a hold of this medium, right? So the presidency, I think, is amplified in a big way by being able to do things like fireside chats and, and go you know, over the heads of the professional media. We call them gatekeepers, you know. The, 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 you know uh, he doesn't have to explain himself to the New York Times or to, you know, the Associated Press. He can 
talk directly to the people for good or for bad, you know? Uh, Rick and then Kira. Yeah, I was going to follow that up with, um, you've been, in respect to politics, you can guide and influence a lot more people mm. um, than, you know, if you're just going through the newspapers where half the country can't read. Yeah, um, yeah. This way you can just, like, influence, instead of 100 people, you can influence, influence you know, a million people. Right, and you're not dealing with all the filters of the local politics right. or politicians or the Like the telephone media. game that they call, like, you know, like, you hear directly what he's saying, not interpretations of what he's saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. Kira? I just, I, it's just a big question. Like, oh, good. find like your version of gatekeepers, because like in right now, like in this generation, gatekeepers definitely I feel like might have a different meaning. Well, in media theory, gatekeepers refers to, for instance, the editors of television shows or newspapers who decide on what is an important story and what is not. Okay. And so they, they, the gate means. They're the ones who open the gate to the flow of communication to their audiences, to their readers, right? So in this case, if FDR just basically says, uh, you know, I want to be on the radio, and the radio just, psh, we open the gate to FDR, you know what I mean? Uh, through, or if Trump tweets, you know, he doesn't have to worry what the, the subsequent analysis of the New York Times is or anybody else, which is likely to be unfavorable. I mean, they fact check him all the time, right? But if he just wants to tweet out whatever he thinks, then that's great. So the, does, does that make sense in terms of the yeah, current? It's, 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 this, it's like almost the same thing. I think it's just used in a different context. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about it more you know, when we get to that part yeah. of it. We last till 11.25, right? Yeah. So OK, so we got like five, six more minutes. Because I, you know, um, I'm just trying to think. So we talked about. Uh, a little bit about politics anyway. And these are just some ideas. There are many more ideas might be coming out of this. So we talked about politics. We talked about kind of a national identity being promoted by broadcasting. Or you know, it was pro certainly already there, people conceiving of themselves as Americans. But you know, we have then, in addition to that, you know, the idea of a national culture, I think, which is the last part of this, which, you know, uh, in the prompt, it talks about advertising and also entertainment. Um, so what do you think the effect of like an electronic mass medium would be uh, in terms of you know, promoting certain artists to us or also uh, giving us advertising messages? What, what changes then? Because, of course, advertising existed before radio. What can you do with radio? Yeah, Chris. Um, well, again, it certainly like it expanded the um, advertising market. Yep. Um, so especially once people started bringing radios into their homes, then you have direct access to millions of people across the country. And then you can create programming that's subtly selling or maybe not so subtly selling a product right. um, and influencing people to buy those products. And then you have commercials for more products in between programs. Yeah. Right, right. Um, wow. Yes. So that's a pretty good summary of, of you know, the developments that, that go on. And, and there's at least three components there that are, pretty, that are pretty interesting. So yeah. Did everyone hear that? If not, review the tape. Right? But Chris was saying that, you know, first of all, the market broadens to a national market. You know, so it's not just regional, but now you're selling your soap or your cornflakes to everybody across the country with a unified message and a unified brand. And plus, you're also you're, you're no longer doing it in a store or something. You're doing it in someone's living room. So there's that sense of intimacy there. There's a couple of ideas. But CJ, I wanted, you had something to say, too. I was just going to kind of elaborate on his point. But, um, yeah. Like advertising, like, it also created, like, a market within itself. So, so, like, I refer, so companies would have to compete against each other, like, create a better jingle to appeal to more customers. Yeah. OK. And more okay. Listeners, so. That's a real interesting point, yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so uh, now that we're into an audio medium, there's many more ways of selling this and many more ways that, of having to uh, differentiate yourself, I think you're saying. So it gives you kind of like this, this uh, uh, media playground in which you can compete as well, which is interesting. Because prior, it would again be in newspapers or stuff like that. Kira, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to like mention how I feel like um, advertising has 
evolved a lot to um, now target certain demographics. Yeah. A lot of, like, like at first it was meant to target everyone, and then now, like, seeing as how far it's come since, like, what, the 20s or 50s or whatever, like, now instead of appealing to everyone, people want to grab the attention of certain demographics. Yeah. Like, a lot of marginalized ones are really popular right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really great point, you know. Yeah. In some ways, we're using the history just to sort of, you know, tell a story about a mass advertising movement, you know, where the, you know, we're talking to huge audiences of millions of people at once. And definitely what you're saying is we can use our current technology and situation to remark that from that mass approach, now it's highly... Uh, stratified, niched, you know, you're, you're talking to very particular audiences. And in terms of broadcasting, it has been the medium, historically, which has determined who you can reach. You know, soap operas were, you know, because the soap companies, the Procter & Gamble or whatever, wanted to reach the people who chose cleaning products in the home. So they programmed, you know, melodramatic, emotionally oriented radio shows in the middle of the day because they expected wives at that time were making those purchasing decisions. So that's, that's the channel they would choose to, to try to reach out to that audience. So in mass communication, advertising, you know, I mean, I think in terms of our prompt, what we like to hear is that, yes, the market gets broader. Uh, that that uh, uh, people you know are now exposed to products which have a national brand, uh, and and that is really productive for those companies. Uh, but also we can look at the way that the media organized time and attention, and we can say that even in those early days, they could target wives at home midday through the radio. They could target families, you know, at prime time or the equivalent. Everybody's sitting around the radio. They could target, you know, uh, uh, well, those are, those are the big segments, I'd say. Versus now, the targeting is way more defined, you know. Uh, and we'll keep on talking about that, but that's a real interesting point. So I hope you have enough ammunition to write up the discussion. You can always I mean, I've, if, if you're not sure you'll be here on Thursday, turn it in today. If you want to digest it more and give it to me on Thursday, that's cool. If you want to engage in the discussion online, that's even cooler because uh, those folks need help. And uh, the more people in the discussion, the better. You know? So uh, either turn it in to me now or on Thursday or by Sunday online uh, is the deadline for this discussion. Okay, thanks. So next class, we'll catch up a little on history.